Hello everybody, my name is Johan, I'm 42 years old and today I thought I'd make a little program about my family history and about the genealogical research that I've made uh, and also about some uh, DNA results that I've received throughout the years. Uh, I really like to watch other people make these kinds of movies, so I hope you will like this one as well. Please join me for the next couple of hours. <laughs> Life on Earth began 3.6 billion years ago, and from that time we have evolved into more and more advanced species. And of course, now, when we will start to look at my family history, we will start at the time when we became Homo sapiens, like 300,000 years ago, uh, and especially from the time uh, after we migrated from Africa, some 100,000 years ago to like 60,000 years ago. 100,000 years ago, there was a climate change on Earth, uh, and by that time, Homo sapiens started to migrate out of Africa in search of new lands to hunt and gather. Uh, and when they came to new regions, they, they were already inhabited by other hominid groups, like the Neanderthals or the Denisova people. Uh, and occasionally, uh, Homo sapiens and these other hominid groups interbred and got uh, offspring. So, some DNA companies have uh, uh, the possibility to match your DNA towards ancient other hominid groups. And uh, this was the case with National Geographic, the genographic project that I took in 2017. And there's results uh, from that test showed that I had 98.9% homo, homo sapien uh, DNA and 1.1% Neanderthal DNA. And uh, this was somewhat less than the average human, uh, which is at 2.1%, but still rather uh, uh, interesting, I would say. Ancient Europe was populated in three migrational waves. The first one being the hunter-gatherers who came here some 48,000 years ago and pretty rapidly expanded across the continent. And if we look at my uh, personal DNA composition, I have 54% from these early migrational waves of hunter-gatherers, so still it's a very high percentage in me. The next wave of uh, migrators were the farmers, the Neolithic farmers who uh, started agriculture some 9,000 years ago in Anatolia. Uh, and they also uh, started to expand into Europe, uh, taking new uh, land into cultivation. They arrived uh, like some 6,000 years ago to Scandinavia. Uh, on a personal level, I have 35% of these uh, old age Anatolian farmers. Uh, and the final ancient group that was to migrate and arrive into Europe were the Jemnaya people, or the Kurgan people, which was the uh, people that were to be the proto-Indo-Europeans. Uh, and they migrated into Europe some uh, 5,000 years ago, approximately, spreading out over different parts of Europe. Uh, they came here to Sweden, for instance, by this uh, battle axe culture. Uh, and uh, of course, all these three groups over time uh, intermarried and got children. So basically nowadays all Europeans can be said to have traces of all these three migrational groups. Uh, my personal uh, percentage of uh, Gemnaya DNA is 11%. Uh, so it's not, not very high, but it's still there present and it's uh, basically mostly uh, interesting when we start to look at my uh, haplo group, my, my, my father, my paternal line, my Y-DNA uh, uh, history. If we look at modern Europeans, 
uh, people have done research uh, comparing their uh, percentage of these three groups nowadays. And uh, if we look at Southern Europe, they have a really high percentage of the farmers. If we look here, we have the Sardinians, the Greek, the French, the, that uh, have a majority of uh, farmer DNA. Uh, and very low numbers nowadays of uh, hunter-gatherers. Uh, if we look further north in Europe, we have higher percentages of hunter-gatherers being, being the highest one in Estonia, in the Baltic. Um, I don't know how exactly how high that is, but that's like 30% 30, 30 something on the average Estonian person. Uh, so comparing myself with other Europeans, I can see that I'm really high hunter-gatherer percentage, um, which is kind of fun knowing that my uh, ancestors have been around here in Europe for quite some time. Uh, farmer DNA, like I said, is higher in the southern Europe while lower in the north. And the Yamnaya is uh, particularly strong also in uh, northern parts of Europe. We can see here that Norway is actually a uh, really high percentage in the Yamnayas. And why is that? Well, that is because that when the uh, Yamnaya got here, uh, it was uh, really not that big of a population from the start in Scandinavia and in Norway. So when they got here, it really became pretty rapidly a high percentage. Okay, so, so this slide is from another DNA company called My True Ancestry. And here you upload your genome to their web page and they match you to uh, ancient archaeological finds throughout the world. And when I got my results, they said that I closely matched the following populations. Vikings, Anglo-Saxons, Longobards, Danish Vikings, Icelandic Vikings, Vikings all over. That was, that was me showing my Neanderthal side. My true ancestry also matched you with ancient civilizations and ancient samples throughout history. And this is my results, my civilization breakdown and my ancient sample breakdown. So what did I get? I got a lot of Longobards. Longobards. They were a Germanic tribe that originated in Scandinavia before the migration period uh, and that left Scandinavia somewhere around the 500s, I think. And went all the way down to Italy, where they founded the Langobard kingdom. So that's the Longobard, the Longbeards with their long axes. This was actually quite surprising to me, because nobody really talks about the Longobards, do they? Uh, even though I am from southern Sweden, nobody really talks about these ancient migrational Germanic tribes. Not the Longobards, not the Ostrogoths, not the Goths, not the uh, Vandals, not the Anglos, not the Saxons, not the any, <laughs> any of these. It's just the Vikings and the Scandinavian peoples. So basically this was interesting with the Longobards. Then of course I got some uh, Viking matching, Swedish Viking, Danish Viking, Icelandic, Norwegian Vikings matching. Uh, also Anglo-Saxon, Ostrogoths, that's also a bit interesting, I think, because that, that's uh, something I, I would like to learn more about, as well as the Gaelic peoples, the ones that, uh, well, <laughs> they got beaten up by Caesar, weren't they? And the Celts, the Celts that basically dominated the entire European uh, continent, but then were pushed back by the Roman Empire out to the uh, Irish and the Scottish uh, Welsh areas. 
Yeah, and the Britons and the Angles and the Vandals. Yep, 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 yep. Interesting, pretty interesting, I'll say. So I'm a lot of Longobard and Viking and yeah. So what ancient people matches me from different time periods? My true ancestry has uh, made this division uh, into different time periods and looking at the first one, the Neolithic age, I got the results that I match ancient proto Longobards, uh, a people who used to live in southern Sweden, uh, and also quite a lot of proto Ostrogoths. And the Ostrogoths also came from uh, Sweden, the eastern parts of Sweden. We have Östra Götaland. And looking at my own family tree, I have my farfar, uh, my father's father. His mother was from Östra Götaland, this region where I believe this group came from uh, a long time ago. So uh, interesting match, uh, pretty logical, I would say. Proto-Gaelic, that is uh, very interesting. Uh, I would like to know more about that connection. Proto-Celts, well, interesting as well, uh, even though the Celts were basically everywhere in Europe. Uh, yeah, interesting. From the early Bronze Age, I still have uh, Proto-Longobards. Uh, a lot, more than 70%. Proto-Ostrogoth, Proto-Gaelic, proto Proto-Celt, and also some small percentages of Proto-Angle, Proto-Vandal, Proto-Britain that matches me, ancient dead people that matches me from that time period. And then we go to the Iron Age. We still have the Longobards but now in smaller numbers, it has decreased a bit. The Ostrogoth is still quite high and the Gaelic 30%. That's interesting. I would like to know more about how that connection came to be. And during the Iron Age, I also match a lot of Vandal. And the Vandals, also a Germanic tribe being from Scandinavia, uh, I believe they originate from uh, a region north of Stockholm called uh, Uppland. Uh, but of course, they're more famous for going down uh, into Europe, vandalizing all the way down to Carthage in uh, uh, northern Africa. Sorry for that. <laughs> I am sorry for my ancestors. No, I'm not. They did uh, what they have to do. Roman age. Okay, so during this time I matched the Longobard, the Gaelic, the Vandals, the Anglo-Saxon, and also starting to match the Vikings from Sweden and Denmark. Uh, going into the Dark Ages, and the Dark Ages, that is uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire in uh, 476, um, Longobard, Gaelic, Anglo-Saxon, and then increasing number of uh, Viking DNA, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and small percentages of Celtic, Angle, Celtic, Dubonny. And finally looking at medieval times, and Talking about all these time periods, we must uh, be aware that this is like European timelines. This is not the Scandinavian timelines that I'm used to. So medieval times here is not medieval times in Scandinavia during this time, because this is still the Iron Age, the Scandinavian Iron Age, with part of the Viking Age. Uh, but during this time, European medieval times, I matched the Longobards, smaller percentage now and that is not strange because during this time they had migrated further south into Europe they had gone down to Italy and now I have just a lot of Viking DNA Swedish Viking Danish Viking Norwegian Viking Icelandic Viking 
small percentage of Celtic and a small percentage of Vandal, as well as Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. No other population, what it seems here, because they match you with uh, peoples all over the world. Here's just a map showing some of the migrations during the migration period of Germanic tribes. We have the Goths and the Vandals, the Angles and Saxons and the Longobards, and how they moved and, uh, of course, impacted many parts of uh, Europe. On this map is another interesting feature, and that is the arrival of the Hunnic uh, people because they were a warlike people that really influenced a lot of what was happened during this early period. So uh, you can say that the, the Germanic migration started from different factors. We have the factor that these areas were being overpopulated. That is one of the factors making people leave. Uh, we also had a lot of uh, people in Germania living as uh, mercenaries who went down into the Roman Empire and came back with a lot of gold to their uh, Scandinavian homelands. Uh, and this, uh, when they came back and told about the riches of the Roman Empire, of course, this triggered also uh, uh, the way to leave and go to, uh, to these richer places. And then, of course, the arrival of the Hunnic people uh, made Eastern Europe a uh, quite dangerous place to be in. So this set many people uh, on the move. This map is also from uh, my true ancestry. And uh, here are all the ancient peoples that they have found that match me. So uh, looking at the map over Europe, it's uh, basically from above the Alps in Central Europe, Southern Germany, uh, quite a lot up in uh, what is present day Czech Republic, uh, up into Northern Germany, Denmark, England, uh, Scotland, Ireland, and then the Scandinavian, uh, Norway, Sweden, and in particular there we can see this Eastern Swedish dots. And that is where I have my most of my ancestry when looking at my close uh, family uh, tree. And there's one dot over at Novgorod, the Rus empire that was actually founded by the Swedish Vikings, the Rus, Rus, Ru, Ro, rowing people, the rowing peoples from Roslagen. Uh, and looking out towards the rest of the world, I didn't find any ancestors in Asia, any in Africa, any in uh, uh, like Australia, South America. North America were a little bit on Greenland, and that must have been the, the Vikings, uh, the Icelandic Vikings who went there. And uh, also some uh, ancestry in uh, America, close to New York, Washington, it looks like. Hmm, interesting, 1683. I believe that was just after the Swedes founded a colony there. Who knows, it might have been connected to that one, or perhaps, I mean, there were other colonies. There were the Dutch colony and, and the English colonies and other colonies. And below we have the uh, matches, again, towards different time periods. Here is also from uh, my true ancestry. We have my 20 closest archeo genetic matches, and we have 20 matches here. Not all of them are visible. Some of them are actually hidden because I don't have this pay version. First match, Germanic tribe, Spreitenbach, CVC Switzerland, Dryburn Bridge East, Lothian, Scotland. 
Alemannic Saxon Bavaria, post Viking era Denmark, St. Clemens, Zealand, Denmark, elite Bronze Age Miku, what Mikulovice, Mikulovice, Bohemia, late medieval Gotlander, Bronze Age Prague, Yonitsche Central Bohemia, Iron Age Prague, Yonitsche Central Bohemia, coded where Plotic. Nad Labem Shek, Viking Age Öland, Sweden. And that was uh, the last one was really plausible because my mother is from this Öland island and my grandfather and mother on her side and going further back there. Let's continue with more results from my true ancestry. And here we have the deep dive results. As they call them, it's ancient relatives matches that my DNA matches uh, in ancient time archaeological uh, digs. So the first person was a Viking Gaelic mix on Iceland in 935 AD, and this individual was a woman. Uh, they uh, put her in the Viking Icelandic population group. And we shared uh, 208 centimorgans. And that's really a lot, I would say. For me, that's a lot. We share the longest chain, 54 centimorgans. And I match her on nine chromosomes. So that's a big match, I would say. The next person, migration period, Lower Saxony, Germany, Hiddastoff, 480. And this is a man, and uh, Lower Saxony, that is like the northwest of Germany, I believe, close to the North Sea. Um, yeah, and uh, we share 83 centimorgans, and the longest chain is 27 centimorgans. So also quite decently high. And I also match him on nine chromosomes though not as much as the first woman. Uh, the third person was a medieval Ireland Kiltesheyan Roscommon bishop seat person uh, found uh, that was thought to have been living in 650 AD. And this individual, a woman, matches the Danish Viking and Longobard population. Uh, and we share one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chromosomes. Uh, 63 centimorgans and the longest chain is 23 centimorgans. Next individual, a Viking Gaelic mix in Iceland, 935 AD again. So the same place, the same population group that it matches is still this one is also a woman even though it's not the same woman because she matches me on other chromosomes than the first one uh, this individual shares 45 centimorgans with me and the longest chain is 19 centimorgans and the final individual here is a viking age opland norway individual from 900 AD. This was a woman uh, and we share 48 centimorgans and the longest chain is 11 centimorgans. One, two, three, four, five, six chromosome matches. So that's the kind of uh, results that you can get on uh, my true ancestry. I thought it was uh, interesting. The next kind of information is about my paternal haplogroup, which is when uh, they studied genetically where your Y chromosome comes from and how you inherit information from your father who inherit things from his father and from his father and so on. All the way back to the time when we migrated from Africa. Uh, so when I got my first uh, results about haplogroup, I got it from family tree DNA and they said that I was part of the R haplogroup 
and uh, specifically RM198. Uh, later on, I've done also this uh, DNA test on uh, the Genographic Project by National Geographic, and they specified even more, uh, even further, that my haplogroup was RCTS4179. And this is actually a, a later mutation. So I'm part of this RM19H, which is part of the R1A1A1 A1, 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 or whatever they call it in the times. Um, yeah. So what about this haplogroup? Well, it is believed to have migrated out of Africa some 60,000 years ago, moving up across the uh, Arabian Peninsula uh, and into uh, central Eurasia, uh, present-day Kazakhstan. They were believed to live here up in Kazakhstan some 24,000 years ago, providing us uh, mammoth hunters, because uh, this was during the time when the Ice Age was still present in uh, Northern Europe, and we still had mammoths to hunt. So that was 24,000 years ago, this hunter-gatherers hunting mammoths. This group eventually migrated into present-day Europe and settled somewhere north of the Black Sea. And there, some 5,300 years ago, they had founded the Yamnaya culture, or the Kurgan culture. Uh, which was to become the Proto-Indo-Europeans who uh, lived a nomadic life. Uh, they were herders, uh, but also occasionally had agriculture, uh, especially close to big rivers uh, and such. And this Yamnaya culture, uh, it also started to migrate further into Europe. And it did so approximately 5,000 years ago, reaching Northern Europe. And there, this Yamnaya people, they were thought to have like somehow wiped out earlier uh, paternal lines. Uh, they don't really know why, if it was like the plague or if it was just uh, through uh, violence and battles because uh, these were warlike people. In Northern Europe, they founded the Corded Ware culture uh, that was to be evolved into a Scandinavian version called the Battleax culture. And my haplogroup is believed to have arrived in Sweden by this Battleax culture. Uh, and the Battleaxes, well, they are known for their axes found in their graves. The axes can also be called boat axes because they resemble the, the shape, the form of a boat. And this was also a time when uh, Scandinavia evolved into the, well, soon into the Bronze Age and uh, had a lot of raiding <laughs> operations across north of Europe. And this Yamnaya Migration was also part of a broader migration from this uh, central Eurasian steppe. We, we can call it the migration of the Indo-European people. Because they migrated all the way down to India uh, and founded the Aryan uh, upper caste who took control of India. They also migrated up into uh, present-day Scandinavia. This is my paternal haplogroup tree. R1A, which I belong to, with all its subclades. Uh, and this uh, uh, chart was made by Family Tree DNA. Uh, and you can uh, follow it by looking uh, uh, from above and uh, to below. It's like a timeline and how this haplogroup has evolved and spread into different uh, regions. So it started as a Siberian hunter-gatherer group, hunting mammoths. Uh, that was to become the Yamnaya culture some 5,000 years ago. Uh, and these were the Proto-Indo-Europeans that started the Indo-European migration 
uh, that spreaded the corded wear culture in Northern Europe and which was to become the battle axe culture in Scandinavia. And this gave rise to the Norsemen in Sweden. And uh, further down the line, you can see my paternal haplogroup CTS4179, which were to become the, uh, well, the Vikings and the present day Scandinavians, and which is the haplogroup that my son will inherit. The genographic project also uh, gave me the results of my maternal haplogroup, which is uh, H1AE1. And this haplogroup is thought to have left Africa some 70,000 years ago. This haplogroup was virtually absent among Mesolithic European hunter-gatherers. It is believed to have originated near present-day Syria some 20,000 to 25,000 years ago. And the subclade H1 is believed to have arose around 22,500 years ago. Uh, if you look at the, the Mesolithic European farmers, 19% of them had this haplogroup H. And today, this haplogroup is predominantly found in Europe. 40% of all maternal lineages in Europe belong to haplogroup H, and especially in Western Europe, this haplogroup can be found today. So that's my mother's uh, haplogroup. Different uh, DNA companies provide different ethnic estimates about your origin. Uh, so before I would like to start to talk about these DNA results, I thought I'd share my own research with you from uh, church archives. And uh, the Swedish church archives, as well as Swedish archives in general, are really good. They have been uh, notorious in uh, writing down basically everything about people, uh, at least in the old days. Uh, so, uh, the church archives provide a lot of information and I have basically covered all of my family tree, all lineages, back to 1780. So that's like a complete tree. I think I miss one person in that complete tree. Uh, so it's like six or seven, it's a seven generations now that I have complete coverage of. Uh, and also, even further back, I have a lot of information about several lines, not all lines, of course, because it basically fades out if you go further back. But looking at all those uh, records, tracing back my origin, I have found that I am 98.9% Scandinavian, because all my descendants are born in Sweden. Uh, going back, I found one person uh, born in Poland that came to Sweden in the 1680s, something like that. So really far back, 1680s. Uh, and also one person who came here in the 1500s from Finland. So if we do the math here, I'm like 98.9% Scandinavian, 1% Polish or Eastern Europe and 0.1% Finnish. Yeah, so that's what my own research has shown. Now to the DNA test. And the first test that I've taken was from Family Tree DNA, and I took this test in 2017. And the first results showed that I was 93% Scandinavian, 4% Eastern Europe, and 3% British Isles. And the biggest surprise in this results was actually the British Isles report. Because looking at my own uh, research, I couldn't find any British connection at all. Not any. Uh, even though it might be plausible that there could be some, some uh, British DNA, uh, especially on my uh, grandmother's side, uh, my father's mother's side, because she was born uh, on the Swedish west coast on a small island out in the archipelago called uh, Åstol. Uh, and 
they were fishermen for generations. I mean, everybody were fishermen on her side, going out fishing in the North Sea, all the way British Isles, Doggill, Banks, and uh, all the way up to Iceland. So British connection, plausible, even though I really didn't believe it. Uh, and then in 2017, Family Tree DNA did an update in their algorithm, so the way they calculate DNA results, and suddenly my results changed a lot. Uh, now showing that I was only 58% Scandinavian, 2% Eastern Europe, 38% British and 2% Finnish. And again, <laughs> the British percentages is just outrageous. I would say there's no chance at all that I am 38% British. I would say that I'm probably not British at all. Because uh, looking at DNA, I mean, Scandinavian people went to Britain. We took control of Britain. Uh, we migrated to your place and you inherited our DNA. The fact that it will be this amount of British DNA here is not plausible. Uh, even of course, there might be some British DNA going back here with the Vikings as slaves, of course, they took slaves as well. Though this number is too high. Uh, the percentage of uh, Eastern Europe is, well, interesting. I think that could be probable, quite accurate, in fact. And the percentage of Finnish DNA showing up here is also interesting, since I know for certain that I am 0.1% Finnish if I have inherited that DNA. I mean, you, you don't inherit the same amount of DNA from every individual in the past, but that part is plausible. Okay, and then in 2020, Family Tree DNA did a third algorithm update, now claiming that I was 54% Scandinavian, so even less than before, 13% British, 3% uh, Finnish, 2% Baltic, and 28% Central uh, Europe. And these results are more accurate than the previous ones, uh, even though they look strange at first. 54% Scandinavian is probably far, far, far too low. But if you look at the category called Central Europe, they actually added up Southern Sweden in that category. Uh, and that's where I have most of my uh, ancestry. 13% British is still too high. Like I said, we migrated to your place. You didn't come back in the same uh, amount. 3% uh, Finnish, well, plausible. 2% Baltic is also plausible, uh, even though I don't think that it's that accurate. Because uh, of course, people have gone over the Baltic. No talk about that. Uh, my mother's side of the family is from the east coast of Sweden. They are from the island of Öland, which is Sweden's second biggest island. And people from Öland migrated to Estonia. Uh, like in the, I, I, I don't remember if it was in the 14, 15 or 1600s, but they migrated to, to islands like uh, Dage or Urme or places like that. Uh, so, in fact, when DNA shows up in the Baltic countries, there might be a chance that modern scientists believe that this DNA is Baltic, even though it originates perhaps in Scandinavia before that. Well, still, there's a connection to the Baltic, that's no doubt. We, we of course, have had connections over the Baltic. Yeah, and uh, my second DNA test was through uh, National Geographic, the Genographic Project in 2017. 
And uh, when I got my results from them, it showed that I was 92% Scandinavian, 7% Eastern Europe, and 1% undetermined. Because uh, this was still when uh, uh, DNA research was, uh, uh, well, not settled, not that certain. It still isn't 100% certain like we can see, but it has uh, been uh, improved a lot. Yeah, so, yeah, interesting as well. In 2019, they did an upgrade. Uh, I got uh, the second result from the same company, same test. Uh, and then it showed a 98% Scandinavian and 2% Eastern Europe. And this is actually the, the test that matches my own church archives the most. Uh, even though I don't really know why they provided a second result here, if the, they did an algorithm change or whether it was because I actually myself uploaded where my... Uh, mother and father were from, they are born in Sweden, and that their mother and father were born in Sweden, and that their mother and father were born in Sweden. I don't know whether that changed their research, because of course they, mu they must get their information somewhere. Okay, so the third DNA test that I have taken was this year, 2022, from my heritage. Uh, and the results that I got showed that I was 91% Scandinavian, 7.6% Finnish, and here comes another surprise, 1.4% Greek or Southern Italian. Now this was shocking as well, because I, like I said, the church archives don't provide any information about such a connection. None of the other DNA tests has shown any such connection. Uh, but then I started to scratch my head here and, and think about this, uh, my true ancestry results, where they claim that I, I, uh, I have a strong uh, genetic mix with the Longobards, this group that originated in Scandinavia, this Germanic group that migrated down into Italy, took control of the north, founded the Lang Longobard uh, kingdom, and they also took control of parts of southern Italy, founded, uh, uh, what do you call it, not dukedoms, earl, well, local uh, control. So, who knows? I don't know. I can't explain it. Uh, I hope uh, I will reach an understanding of this somehow. The next result I will show is uh, when I uploaded my family tree DNA, my genetic code, to my true ancestry and how they placed my uh, ethnicity in comparison with other uh, European peoples. It comes here. So. Here we have a principal component analysis from my true ancestry. And uh, to the left here, we can see uh, a chart uh, where they have matched my genetic code with other European populations. Uh, and there is a red, little red star here where it says you, which means me. Uh, and it's placed just next to the Swedish population, which is of course makes sense because I'm born in Sweden and my parents are Swedish. I have Swedish origin. Uh, on this chart we can also see blue dots and that is the closest, closest genetic modern populations that I match. So here we have Swedish, Norwegian, North Dutch, Danish, North German, North Swedish, West Norwegian and Irish. So that is what uh, this uh, my true ancestry 
results shows when it comes to my origin or my closest matches nowadays. This result kind of resembles the ones that I got from the Genographic project. Uh, there they also had reference populations. Uh, it wasn't that many reference populations as they have nowadays, but uh, in the lower part of the screen here you can see my reference populations that I matched the most, and that was Norwegian and Danish reference populations. Uh, they didn't have a Swedish reference population at the time, so yeah. It showed that I'm Scandinavian, basically. To the right here we have another uh, principal component analysis uh, matching my DNA with ancient people. And we can see here that there are several hidden uh, uh, samples. And that is because I don't have the fully payable version yet. Uh, so I'll just leave that. If someone is interested, just have a look there. This next result is from Family Tree DNA, and it's called a chromosome painter. Every human being has 22 chromosomes that kind of stores up your DNA uh, material. And this uh, DNA can be matched to different uh, populations or ethnic groups. And that, that is what uh, Family Tree DNA has done here. So the results that they provided was that I was 100% European, that the DNA in my chromosomes were 94.7% Western Europe, uh, which they said was Scandinavian, Central Europe, England, Wales, and Scotland all mixed together. They said that I had 3% Finnish DNA and 2.4% Baltic DNA. And this is how this uh, DNA uh, material from different ethnic groups is combined in my DNA. So uh, interesting, I would say. The funny part is that uh, my true ancestry also had a result, speaking of your chromosome results, and I placed it next to this one here. So here we have the my true ancestry results. It's the also 22 chromosomes, and here we can see which ancient population that actually gave me influx to my DNA. So we see on top it's the Longobard and we can see that this group has really given me a lot of DNA materials. It's in almost all chromosomes. Anglo-Saxon is in uh, seven chromosomes. Uh, Celtic is not that present, it's in two chromosomes. Uh, Viking Danish is found in one, six chromosomes. Gaelic in six chromosomes. Ostrogot is more presently found. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Even though it's kind of pale, so maybe it's not that high in frequency, but present in many chromosomes. Then we have the Viking Icelandic, which is also quite a lot and colorful here, 11 chromosomes. Then we have the Swedish Vikings in 12 chromosomes. And then we have a group here called the Balari. And I believe that was a group in uh, one of the Mediterranean islands. I don't remember if it was Korsika, uh, perhaps. And this group is believed to originate, I think, in uh, the border between Spain and France, up in the mountains. Not really sure, but it's uh, one, two, three, four, five chromosome uh, matches on this group. Then we have Viking Norwegian, and that is in seven chromosomes. Angle, not that present, not that surprising, in two chromosomes. OC, I don't know what that is really, in one chromosome. Vandal, 
are found is found in one, two, three, four, five chromosomes and Friesi in one. And Friesi, that is like, is that in Belgium, right? Friesland, Friesland, I think so. Yeah, so interesting kind of chart showing where you get the chromosomal materials from. That was all the DNA test results that I could show you. Now I will talk a little bit about my family research that I have done, of course, by asking living relatives and also by collecting materials from relatives and spending a lot of time studying church archives, making up my uh, family tree. So this side here is all the photos that I've been able to find on my close relatives. So it's like six generations of my family tree with me in the middle, Johan, above me, my father and mother, Robert and Inger, and below me, my two children, Elsa and Arvid, and to the right of me is their mother, Jenny. And on the left side, we have my father's side of the family. And on the right side, we have my mother's side of the family. If I would talk about something else here, perhaps I could mention my family name, Falk. Because uh, I am Johan Falk, my son is Arvid Falk, my father Robert Falk. And his father, uh, Anders Falk, was not actually named Anders Falk from birth. Because he was named Anders Andersson by his father, who was Arvid Andersson uh, and August Andersson. So if we go back, we are actually on the Andersson side of the family. <laughs> uh, but my grandfather, Anders, he didn't like the name Anders Andersson. So he actually, in adult age, he took his mother's name, Falk. So that's where we got our name Anders Falk. It's from Matilda here, who got it from her father, Johan Ludwig Falk. And if we trace this Falk name, uh, it goes all the way back to 1760. Uh, the first uh, Falk person was actually a soldier in the Östgöta Cavalry Regiment uh, in 1760. So that's, that's the family name Falk. It's not a straight paternal line, but it has been in the family for uh, several hundreds of years. And I like the name Falk. It means falcon. It was very common that soldiers got these kind of names uh, since they were easy to shout out uh, during battles and exercises and stuff like that. So they were usually named like animals or, or uh, features in nature, like tree or like uh, oak or other. My mother's family, my mother's, uh, what is it called, maiden name is Oak, Ek. It's quite difficult to make visual presentations of family trees, since if you go back in time, every generation is double the amount of people than in the previous uh, generation. So every generation you go back, there will be lots of more people. So I have basically set the limit here of showing you where my ancestors were born if you go back until the 1780s until now 2022 and i've presented this uh, results on the map here to the right this map shows southern sweden and all the little dots here are parishes where my ancestors have been born and me i was born in harplinge on the Swedish West Coast. My uh, father, he was born in Västervik on the Swedish East Coast. My mother was born on Öland on the Swedish East Coast. And uh, my father's father, he was born in Stig Tomta up in Sörmland. My father's mother, she was born on Rönning, 
parish out in the Swedish west coast, the archipelago there. And my mother's parents were both born on Öland in Borgholm uh, on the Swedish east coast. And then we have the red dots here. That is my father's father, where his side of the family comes from. And you can see it's a lot of, uh, well, uh, the, now I will talk about the provinces in Sweden. It's, it's a lot of Sörmland, it's a lot of Östergötland on his side, but also in the south, some small dots uh, in Skåne. So that's his side of the family. Then we have my uh, father's mother's side, that, that is the pale or light blue dots. And you can see all of her family is centered around these archipelago islands like uh, Åstol, Sjön, Marstrand, other places close to the Sea of Kattegat. And then we have my mother's uh, side of the family. My mother's father, his side of the family are the yellow dots here. And that is a lot of small land, inner small land, but also quite a lot of Öland. And then we have the green dots, that is my mother's mother's side of the family. And that is also a lot of small land, a little bit of north uh, eastern Skåne, Scania as well. So that is like the visual presentation of where my family comes from. You can see it's uh, east side of Sweden, southeast Sweden mainly, but also a little bit on the Swedish west coast. And if we take this results and place it on the maps on the left side here, first we have the family tree DNA map where they have done big circles trying to pinpoint where, where my ancestry is from. I place the results of my own research here. And also on the my heritage DNA map in the lower left corner, there you have my results showing. So where my ancestors lived going back until 1780s. The last thing I would like to share with you are uh, some examples of uh, professions that are found in my family tree going back uh, until uh, the 1780s. So here are some examples. I started with my grandparents and like I said, my father's father, he was a train driver. Uh, he drove this kind of orange uh, trains that Sweden used to have, the RC3, which they were called. I really loved those. They were, were beautiful trains. Uh, his wife, my grandmother, was an uh, assistant nurse who worked with the children. And my mother's father, he was a owner of a shoe shop. He sold shoes to people in uh, Öland, in Borgholm. So that was his profession. He, he had all kinds of jobs during his uh, career. But that was the thing I think he did the most. And then my grandmother on my mother's side, she was, uh, she was sending telegrams in the old days, sending and receiving uh, messages. And if we go back at my grandmother's side, on my father's side, they were all fishermen. They were living out in the uh, Kattegat region, uh, fishing in the North Sea, fishing in Kattegat, Skagerrak, North Sea, up uh, towards British Isles and all the way up to Iceland. So they, they were lots of fishermen. I have some gardeners in the family, not many, I think there are like one. There are also uh, at least one person who is a, a carriage driver. And then we have some different kinds of workers. For instance, people working with stone breaking or stone carving and stone masons. And then during the 19th century, there were a lot of like all over Europe, there were poor people working as uh, workers in factories. So then we had workers, we had also casters in the family working with iron. And then we 
go back like to the 18th century, there were lots of soldiers at that time. Soldiers that uh, were away during Swedish campaigns, but also that were at home taking care of a small plot of land, being this, what we call in Swedish, torpare. I think it's called a crofter or something like that in English, I'm not sure. But a bit poorer kind of uh, uh, farmers. And then we have the like yeomen or the, the, the farmers that own their own estates, their own lands. There was also uh, several of those in the family. Uh, we have uh, people working as skippers, being in the trade industry, I mean, especially on the Baltic. We have some uh, millers, especially on Öland, this island, there are several mills there. Then we had people who uh, were living as humans, but ha were such uh, high people that they ac could actually provide for uh, these kind of uh, crofters, supplying their, them while they were away doing wars. Uh, there are some examples of hat makers and finally molsters producing beer. So that was just some examples of professions in Swedish history. I would say the most common in my tree are fishermen. It is uh, different kinds of farmers that either owned their own estate or were working at other people's estates. And then of course there were several, several soldiers a lot of soldiers in the family. Okay. Okay, folks, that was it. I really hope you liked this video. And uh, if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, and please also share your own DNA results here on YouTube so we can watch and learn about human uh, history. Uh, I hope you have a nice uh, day. Bye bye.